Hello and welcome to this episode of In Focus, the Hindu's podcast series and lately a video series as well where we discuss news that has animated public discourse. I'm Kunal Shankar. On July 30th, India and the United States marked a historic milestone in space collaboration with the successful launch of NISAR, the NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar Satellite. This flagship Earth observation mission jointly developed by the two space agencies is the first satellite to use dual frequency radar, NASA's L-band and ISRO's S-band to continuously monitor the Earth's surface. NISAR is expected to deliver breakthrough data on land deformation, glacier, dynamic forest biomass and natural hazards such as earthquakes and floods. With high resolution all weather, day night imaging capabilities, the mission is poised to significantly improve climate, resilience, agriculture, monitoring and disaster response. Beyond its scientific value, NISA could also unlock new commercial opportunities, powering geospatial analytics, data services and early warning systems across industries from insurance and infrastructure to agriculture. To discuss this scientific milestone and what this means to global space cooperation, we are joined by Dr. Karen St. Germain. Dr. St. Germain is the director of the Earth Science Division at NASA's Science Mission Directorate, where she oversees NASA's full Earth Science portfolio, satellite missions, technology, applied research, and data to action programs. Karen, thank you so much for joining us today. So can you give us a few examples of scientific studies that are possible with NASAR but haven't been possible so far with the existing crop of Earth observation satellites? Absolutely, and it's great to be with you. Um, NISAR, the way to think about NISAR is that it will see any, anything that has structure to it that moves, that changes its position at a scale of uh, less than a centimeter um, over, o over an area about the half of a tennis court, so 10 foot, say, square. Um, so that means, when I say anything that has structure, it could be forest, it could be buildings, it could be glaciers, mountains, land. So anything that moves we'll see at an unprecedented level of fidelity. And what that means is we will be able to see the slight bulging that happens before a volcano erupts. Uh, we'll be able to see um, the lands, uh, land becoming unstable before a landslide. We'll be able to see building shifts after an earthquake or, or any other sort of event. So anything that moves, a forest that gets cut down, we'll be able to see that. So anything that changes, we'll be able to see. And that's an extraordinary new capability for us. Okay. Great. And, um, you know, after the launch, NISAR will start its 90-day uh, commissioning phase and this is the world's first dual band um, SAR satellite. In this phase, uh, do you foresee any challenges with calibration, especially with cross-band calibration and could you break down that process for us? Yeah, the, so uh, there are a number of different aspects to the calibration and, uh, and largely the ISRO team will focus on calibrating the S-band radar and the NASA team will focus on calibrating the L-band radar, and they don't really get cross-calibrated, but each one will look at its own special targets. Now, what do I mean by a target? It's something we call a corner reflector, and it is exactly what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. It's a corner, just like the corner of a room, right. and it has a special feature, which is that when a pulse of energy hits it from any direction, it reflects back in exactly the same direction. So right. we use these targets. Uh, to, to calibrate independently each of the uh, instruments. And then the only other thing we really have to pay special attention to is the alignment, the pointing. Are right. they pointing in the same place on the ground? Uh -huh. And for that, we'll use, uh, we'll use the data itself. So the data itself will uh, identify features and we'll align those, those features oh, see. From, each, from each radar. Okay. Great. So... NASA's investment in NISAR is about $1.2 billion, right? That's about right. So, if possible, could you tell us how this cost breaks down on the U.S. side? Well, the, uh, the way NASA builds missions, we establish a life cycle cost. 
So that, uh, that life cycle, it starts when we start designing and it runs through the design phase, the, the build, the integration, the launch, and all the way through the, uh, what we call the prime mission, which for NISAR is the first three years. For NISAR, that included uh, the deployable antenna. It's the most distinguishing feature mm -hmm. of, of NISAR. It included the L-band radar. And of course, the L-band and the S-band are operating through the same reflector. And then, uh, uh, of course, uh, there are various electronics and data handling uh, elements as well. So, um, uh, and then there are the people, right? The, the people that, that put it all together and, and worked so closely with the team from India. So even after we were finished building our part, our team came to, uh, to India to work with ISRO to integrate it onto the spacecraft and prepare for launch and even sat on console. Uh, for for the launch, so it's uh, it's a it's a total cost. Um, and you know, speaking of costs, and and uh, there, there's a lot of interest about the commercial aspect, uh, the applications aspect of NASA. Yeah. And uh, uh, could you just tell us a bit about the kind of uh, interest that it has generated? Uh, yeah, and actually, let me let me take a step back and talk about Earth observation data in general, because in general, yeah. understanding. Uh, the the earth it's you know the surface the atmosphere um, and the change that changes large and small that can yeah. have impact on communities and businesses uh, that's become uh, an enormous area of interest in in fact um, NASA has been collecting data on the earth system for uh, more than 60 years now right and uh, and we find that about three quarters of our Fortune 100 companies are drawing some something out right. of that Earth observation and archive, um, and we also find Impressive. that about 75 percent of our users, and we have more than five million users, yeah. about 75 percent of those are coming from .dot com right. uh, addresses. So we are talking about agriculture producers. Um, and uh, the insurance industry, the finance industry, the transportation industry, um, and that's before you even get to things like disaster response. Right. So we have a tremendous interest in general. Mm -hmm. For NISAR specifically, we know that NISAR will produce data that uh, can directly benefit agriculture, yeah. um, and then also risk assessment, everything from natural hazards like I mentioned earthquakes and volcanoes, uh, which are both issues in the U.S., but also things like wildfire risk, yeah. because NISAR will be able to characterize how much fuel is in our, in our wildlands. So that's right. uh, dry fuel that is uh, burnable. So, um, so there are all these application areas. Um, and one of the things that we do that we're really excited about is anytime we launch a new mission, we, uh, we have an early adopters program. Yeah. These are people out there who anticipate what NISAR might do for them in their business. And they don't actually, we don't require that they tell us a lot about yeah. what they intend to do. But right now for NISAR we have, I think it's at least a 200 of these early adopters. And once the data start to roll out and the excitement builds, yeah. uh, we expect it to take off from there. Which you believe is a high number. The early it's, adopters, yeah. It's a high number for uh, for a mission that is um, that is as sophisticated as this. Um, uh, and what I, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is um, pictures are generally easy for people to use. Right. Synthetic aperture radar data requires some pretty complex processing right. to turn it into usable information. Right. Uh, but all the data is free and openly available. Uh, from us, uh, we will distribute it out of the Alaska SAR facility, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, that will be the L-band data. Uh, and uh, our colleagues at ISRO, they they will they have their own distribution mechanism for That's the right. S-band data, but it will also be open and freely available. Available, right? Okay. Speaking of big numbers, uh, also can you explain why NISA took 11 years to build? Were there any particular uh, particularly difficult engineering challenges that you had to overcome first? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, first, it's an enormously complex system yeah. with uh, many dozens of sub-assemblies and, and, uh, that had to be designed. And of course, 
uh, to make these two radars work together and operate through a single reflector, uh, there's a lot of design work that had to happen up front. Um, so it was challenging to begin with. And then we had a couple of other uh, particular challenges. One, uh, this one happened right as I was starting my job, right. um, was uh, COVID hit. So think about uh, an integrated engineering team already separated by time zones and distance and now uh, having to work through a, a global pandemic. Virtually. And, uh, well, also in person. A lot of this work had to happen in person. In person. So we had people who had to travel at right. the height of COVID, uh, had to leave their families Right. Um, and remember that the waves of COVID hit differently in the U.S. and India. That's right. So we had people uh, on both teams uh, sometimes uh, come down with COVID yeah. when they were in the opposite country. And so we had to take care of one another's teams. Right. Um, and then we had to develop entirely new protocols right. for how people could work together in a space uh, and remain healthy. Right. So, so that was a big one. And then more recently, we, uh, the, this reflector is an enormous, uh, it's a 40-foot, about a 40-foot mm -hmm. deployable reflector. And, uh, and when we were in India integrating and we were testing in thermal vacuum, we saw some data that worried us. Uh -huh. And uh, we were really afraid that uh, there may be too much of a thermal load on that reflector before it gets deployed. Right. And, uh, and it may overheat. And if it did that, it could uh, challenge the structural integrity. And of course, when you've got a deployable antenna, if it doesn't stay taut, right. it doesn't reflect the way you want it to. So we ended up uh, demating that reflector, bringing it back home, um, applying a reflective coating so the sun couldn't cause it to overheat on the struts, not on the reflector surface itself. And, uh, and then we had to ship it back and reintegrate. So we, we had a couple of technical challenges, which we expect when you're doing something as difficult as this. Right, collaborative. Speaking of challenges, uh, what do you think are the limitations uh, in, in terms of um, penetration depth of the L-band versus the S-band? I, I don't. I think I would not frame it so much in terms of limitations as mm -hmm. I would frame it that they are both specialists and they just mm -hmm. have different specialties. So the L band has a longer wavelength, and uh, and that means it can penetrate deeper. Mm -hmm. So it can penetrate through foliage, and of course they'll both right. be able to create imagery in day and night through clouds and weather. It's just that when there is some, uh, some material there, like foliage, the L-band will penetrate further. It will interact with larger structures. The S-band right. uh, will give you more information about that foliage because it's more sensitive to it. Ah. So that's just one example. So they, they will really just see different things. Right. And the power then will be when we combine the information from them and get a more holistic, holistic sort of view. Right. Right, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> this is kind of a follow-up to that. Uh, both the L-band and the S-band radars use the same reflector. Since S-band has a shorter wavelength than the L-band, uh, does this create any trade-offs in either L-band or S-band performance? It doesn't. And the reason for that is because this is a synthetic aperture radar. So it uh, creates its spatial resolution um, as it moves along. Each radar is taking snapshots as it moves along. You know, to get this kind of centimeter level fidelity and uh, the kind of spatial resolution we're achieving, if you were to use a, uh, a, a solid antenna, it would be miles long. Right. Uh, just like when you're talking about a camera, if you want to be able to get high fidelity, you need a big lens. Same idea. But we can't deploy an antenna that big. So what we do, this is still a pretty big antenna, but what we do is we, uh, we build up image after image after image um, to get that, that resolution. And uh, because of this technique, it's actually independent of wavelength. Okay. So it works the same for S and for L. So again, the only thing that's a little different is uh, because the, the feeds, the antenna feeds for the L-band and the S-band, 
they can't physically occupy the same space, mm -hmm. so they have to be next to each other, and that means there's a slight difference in the way they, uh, the way their pulses reflect off the antenna okay. and, and come back. So that's that positioning difference okay. that we can correct for. Uh, could you uh, tell us a little bit more about that slight difference? It's, uh, yeah, so, um, so the way a reflector works, the fo you, you would ideally want to put the feed at the focal point of the reflector. Uh, but when you have two feeds, right. You can't, uh, you can't do that. So they're slightly offset. So that means they illuminate the reflector just slightly differently. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so the alignment is just a little bit different. Mm -hmm. The team optimized uh, the design to, uh, to minimize that difference and to make it so that they could correct it in post-processing. Okay. All right. Um, and, um, you know, how do NASA and JPL's radar systems uh, for planetary exploration feed into and evolve from their Earth observation um, systems? And even at the moon, NASA and ISRO um, have been collaborating specifically using radar systems of uh, DFSAR on Chandrayaan-2, uh, Orbiter, and the Mini-RF on um, LRO. Can we imagine a NISAR built for missions to the moon or Mars or beyond? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And of course, um, it, once you have expertise in a technology, you can use it in many, many ways. And this is often the case in NASA between Earth science and planetary science. Uh, one, uh, one of us will uh, develop a new technology or advance a new technology, and then it can be right. used very broadly. So, uh, so absolutely, and we love that kind of interplay. I love seeing Earth Science Technologies make it into planetary missions. Um, so that's one, one aspect. The other thing is what we learn from NISAR yeah. on Earth can inform what we understand about other planets. Right. Uh, so, right. so there are lots of ways that we interact right. across the disciplines. Could you give us an example of a, a lesson that you would learn from NISAR? With the well, um, let's see. Uh, certainly, uh, one of the things that uh, NISAR is is going to tell us about is what's going on underneath the crust of the Earth, underneath the surface, mm. because we'll be able to see uh, these very small motions that you and I don't experience right. daily. Right? We can't sense these, uh, but NISAR will, um, and it will allow us to advance our models about how the interior of planets work. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and those kinds of models are the same models we use when we try to understand how a planet like Mars works. Um, so yeah. I see, right, it's, yeah. So as you said, it could be interchangeably used in planetary missions as yeah. well as... So NISA is a first of its kind equal partnership between uh, NASA and ISRO. So can you tell us what kind of precedent this collaboration sets of future major collaborations or technology sharing between the two organizations? First, I will say I have been singularly focused on getting NISAR off the ground um, and, and not really looking beyond. Yeah. Um, of course, uh, you know, when I, when I uh, was preparing for launch, one of the things that I did was uh, I found, not found, I went and, and, uh, and bought a little figure of Ganesh. Mm -hmm. Because my understanding is uh, Ganesh brings, uh, brings uh, good, uh, good tidings for the beginning of an enterprise. Mm -hmm. And so as for as long as we've been working on NISAR, really the launch represents the beginning of that collaboration. Right. We will be working together closely uh, for many years just to extract all the value out of NISAR. Um, but as, as you said, NASA and ISRO are working together in many ways in, in human exploration That's right, um, yeah. and, uh, and potentially in other areas. So um, I think, I hope, uh, I, and I think that we will have a rich collaboration for a very long time. And I think it will span the areas of interest from um, earth science to planetary science and human exploration. And that's it from us. Thank you for watching. And for more such videos, do follow the Hindu's YouTube channel and follow us on your various social media platforms.